Welcome back. I'm Angelo Sinopoli, one of the co-chairs of PTAC. I'm pleased to welcome three experts who have experienced who have experience with how payment features can encourage some of the innovations we've been discussing earlier today. You can find their full biographies posted on the ASPE PTAC website along with their overview slides. I'll briefly introduce our guests and give them a few minutes each to share an overview of their key takeaways. First, we have Ms. Aisha Pittman, a Senior Vice President of Government Affairs with the National Association of ACOs, NACOs. Aisha, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. If we go to the next slide, um, just a little bit about NACOs. We are an association that represents more than 400 ACOs and MSSP, the Medicare Share Savings Program, the ACO REACH model, and then other CMMI models. And our members are also engaged in, in risk value arrangements with other payers. We really appreciate PTAC's interest in examining the barriers to rural provider participation in total cost of care models. I think if we are to ever reach CMS's goal of having 100% of traditional Medicare beneficiaries, in a clinical relationship responsible for total cost of care and quality, we really need to think about how we uh, bring uh, more participation to rural providers, including um, federally qualified health centers, rural health centers, and critical access hospitals. So if we go to the next slide to, to get into some of our recommendations, um, we're really thinking about this from the, the perspective of how can we bring uh, more role providers into uh, the existing ACO models, which are a strong total co cost of care models. Ultimately, we really have to recognize that role providers are fundamentally different in how we pay them, the populations they serve, and the unique challenges. The one size fits all approach has not worked, and we need to adapt existing total cost of care models or, mod or create new models targeted towards role providers. Um, I think efforts to bring rural providers into total cost of care must account for access. And so we have to really build everything from uh, re uh, maintaining or um, increasing access to care. Um, and potentially that also means having a lower focus on reducing costs um, because ultimately some of the lower cost care settings might not be available. If we think about the lack of specialty care, urgent care and post-acute care, that's a unique challenge that you might not have in other areas. So for example, in the absence of an inpatient rehab facility, the care may be need to be delivered in a critical access hospital. That represents a lack of an opportunity for a rural community to lower costs that might be available in other cities. So from here, I wanna go through, um, if we're using the ACO as a chassis, chassis for uh, increasing rural provider participation, what are some of the opportunities to improve the, the, the current models for rural providers? So on to the next slide, wanting to first think about attribution. So ultimately, ACOs are built on this primary care relationship. And if we think about some of the providers in rural settings, this creates several limitations. So one being that many rural pr practices do not include a physician and, and therefore don't uh, drive attribution. We hear from our members with significant penetration in ACOs that they lose a lot of attribution uh, just because they have several NP only TINs um, and the current construct for uh, attribution in ACOs is all based around a primary care visit. So needing to think about that a little bit differently, if we look at, like, for example, federally qualified health centers, um, a significant portion of their, uh, they have a lot of patient churn and so therefore can't maintain attribution from year to year. Um, additionally, the, the billing at the facility level makes it difficult to understand when you are attributing beneficiaries to your ACO and, and um, through which providers. Some potential solutions in this area is to create rural specific attribution approaches. So does that mean um, one of the things would be attribution steps for certain rural providers? So you could have, say, a um, advanced practitioner provider attribution just for rural communities. Looking at multi-year approaches of uh, alignment and attribution to account for the churn that the rural providers tend to see. Um, if a patient's um, only having a visit um, occasionally, then they might not attribute to the ACO from year to year. So how can we expand that and look at more years? 
And then just additional data is one thing that we strongly heard from our members of being able to better understand how and why providers are aligning to the ACO. If we go to the next slide, I wanted to talk about benchmarks and the challenges that exist there. So FQHCs, RHCs, and critical access hospitals all operate under unique billing and reimbursement conditions, which present challenges to um, the participation in total cost of care models. We think about FQHCs and RHCs, they are limited to being re reimbursed for one service per day. So this creates a scenario where the FQHCs can deliver multiple services per visit, but they're only getting paid for one service. This has led to a climate where the clinicians are often picking and choosing what services they provide patients. And then sometimes the, the patients have to come back for additional services. This just creates a um, challenge in when you wanna think about how you redesign care delivery because of the restrictions of the existing payment system. Um, I think another example for FQHCs and RHCs is they are prohibited from providing the annual wellness visits and any chronic care management in one day. They're not, they tend to provide these things both in one day, but it doesn't get captured in billing. And so it becomes difficult to really assess what type of care that they are uh, providing. We think about a critical access hospital, they're paid under a cost reimbursement. Uh, cost-based reimbursement system. So 90% of their of their costs are fixed and opportunities um, for spending reductions are limited. If you reduce the number of admissions to a critical access hospital in a particular year, you're still gonna have the same amount of payment. And so that is immediately in conflict with the concept of shared savings. And so um, it has to think about a different paradigm shift to be able to account for those payment um, systems. Another challenge with regard to benchmarks is around um, the risk adjustment approaches. So um, in the existing payment systems for these settings, risk adjustment is, um, there's, there's no incentive to focus on risk adjustment. And so when these providers attribute beneficiaries to, the, to an ACO, the beneficiaries typically seem lower risk, therefore they have lower, a lower benchmark. And then there are caps on how, on how much an risk score can increase within an ACO. And so you quickly hit those caps once you have the incentive in the ACO to focus on coding and risk adjustment. It's just underemphasized because of the historical um, approach for reimbursement in those settings. And so you have to think about, are there ways to adjust risk adjustment for these populations that historically don't have um, uh, uh, significant coding documentation. Some potential solutions in this area, what, you know, when we're thinking about total cost of care, this is where we might need additional models. So thinking about global budgets or prospective population-based payments, those are options that are um, really attractive to rural providers. Um, I think with uh, when CMMI was considering the chart model that was going to be a rural-based uh, population model, there was some interest in that. I think uh, timing uh, prevented and mandatory Medicaid participation prevented that from moving forward. I know with the recently announced um, AHEAD model, this is, that would be a global budget focus. That is something that uh, can address some of those overarching payment challenges um, in rural settings. Some other things to think about is lowering the discounts or the minimum savings rates for rural providers in risk-bearing models, just recognizing that um, you might not be accounting for the historical costs in the current benchmarking approach, and so their ability to create additional savings is limited. Um, in terms of the risk challenges, I mentioned adapting risk adjustment policy a policy so you do not disadvantage sicker populations. This could be things like um, accounting for the lack of historical coding. So you could increase the risk caps for rural po populations or beneficiaries without historical ac access to care. You could also, um, as I think ever is a hope, is to bring in more social risk factors over time to improve the risk coding um, methodology. There also has to be some considerations for specific costs that are unique to rural communities. Um, you know, I, hear an, I heard an example from one of our members that they had two uh, needs for air ambulance in a year, and because of that significant cost, it was gonna cause them to exceed their benchmarks for that particular performance year. 
that is something that you uh, is much harder to account for. And so we need more outlier approaches so that we're not penalizing um, uh, the ACOs for these minor changes in care. Um, and then I think uh, additionally um, is uh, thinking about uh, alternative measures of success to financial benchmarks. So um, is it that instead of saving costs constantly, maybe it is that you're reducing your uh, trend over time. Um, and then if I go to the, the my final points around um, flexibility within the models on the next slide, um, I think one of the things we overarchingly hear is that providers need additional technical so rural providers need additional technical support in um, to participate in models. Um, things that our members have raised is that the the waivers uh, tend to be a one size fit all approach as well. So thinking about waivers in models that are specific to rural providers. So. For example, for the FQHCs and rural health communities, waiving the one visit one site requirement making it easier to provide hospital at home, removing some of their face-to-face -face billing requirements for certain services like the annual wellness visits. Um, and then I think providing more avenues for, the, for uh, rural providers to understand the impact of the total cost of care policies um, on those providers. I just described uh, three settings, the FQHCs, rural health centers, and critical access hospitals where they are to date participating in ACOs, but when they're asked to seek support of how their payment system interacts with the ACO, it's really hard to get answers. So having much more of a focus of, of how and more detailed information from CMS for how those providers can meaningfully participate in, in any um, value-based care model. And that sums up my comments. Thank you so much for the time. Great presentation. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, Jackson? Great. Well, uh, I'm really honored to visit with you today and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. In particular, uh, honored to be included in a discussion with uh, Aisha and Mark Holmes. Uh, these guys are true subject matter experts. I'm just boots on the ground in Central Texas, so I'm going to speak fairly generally. Um, but uh, but I want to start uh, next slide with, uh, with Texas. Texas holds the distinction of having the largest rural population in the U.S. with over 70% of its counties housing fewer than 50,000 residents. Uh, rural Texas is economically vital though. Uh, it produces an impressive 50, uh, sorry, 21 billion in annual goods, uh, but uh, the region's beset by challenges, uh, high rates of poverty, educational shortfalls, food insecurity, which intensify uh, health challenges. Next slide. So uh, here in Texas, we've uh, repurposed um, a maritime term to fit our cattle industry. A bum steer in Texas uh, signifies a deal that doesn't deliver as expected. So rural health systems see the move to value-based care in that light. Uh, so value-based care translates to underfunded initiatives that pile on responsibilities without truly addressing the unique challenges of rural Texas healthcare. Next slide. So to, to illustrate my uh, main argument, I'm, uh, I'm gonna use Abraham Maslow's familiar hierarchy of needs that was first described in, in, in 1943. This hierarchy, you know, starting from basic physiologic needs ascends to self-actualization, uh, but, but you've got to satisfy each level before progressing on. So next, clinical systems operate in a similar fashion. Uh, the end goal is a healthcare system that offers equitable healthcare to all segments of the, of the population. But reaching that summit of health equity first demands foundational infrastructure followed by financial stability. Uh, because you know, how, how can rural health systems envision delivery reform to achieve health equity when they're just trying to pay their nurses a fair wage and bankruptcy is constantly nipping at their heels? Uh, with financial security, uh, then integration within the broader health and social ecosystems can be achieved. And once integrated, then we can arrive at, at true quality and aggregate. But of course, uh, 
in, in aggregate doesn't mean that health equity, a situation which you know, everyone in society has the opportunity to thrive, has been achieved. Health, health equity is a, is a national moral imperative, um, but for, for medicine in particular, health equity is intrinsic to our, our, our core bioethic of justice. So it's, it's critical that we invest sufficiently to get there. Um, so how do we how do we create systems in underfunded communities to achieve health equity? Uh, next. So my my aim uh, in this model is is to present a conceptual framework. Obviously, not to offer precise financial calculations. What's crucial is recognizing the need for foundational investments before assuming capacity of higher level performance. Next. In a nutshell, I'm, I'm suggesting that foundational investments necessary before there can be expectations of high performance. And such investments should be rooted in proven methods and, and tailored to specific rural demographics, all while safeguarding our already overburdened healthcare professionals from the burnout risks associated with both clinical practice and uh, systems change. Next. A little about us, our FQHC resides in the heart of Central Texas uh, through, uh, so our, our service area is uh, McLennan County and the city of Temple, but but patients from 14 counties uh, seek our services. Next. This depicts that region uh, there. Uh, now, next, in the same region, several rural health clinics and critical access hospitals are, are managing to stay operational on uh, a shoestring. Next, but if we zoom into that same area, we find numerous small communities, each housing less than 2000 residents spread across an area that exceeds the size of the state of Delaware. Next, the staggering 73% uh, of our FQHC patients live below the federal poverty level with a third lacking any form of insurance. And of course, uh, in Texas, Medicaid has not been expanded and, and FQHCs have also missed out on the state's 1115 waiver benefits and, and this creates dire challenges. And in light of these constraints, uh, patients drive long distances in a centripetal pattern to see us. Uh, patients carrying a, a disproportionate burden of chronic illness, mental health conditions, substance use disorder, and health-related social needs associated with their rural circumstances. Next. Could, could value-based care um, help with this? Um, well, what we've learned from our initial experiences in a hospital-centric ACO with a traditional MSSP um, well, it would suggest no, it, 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 it can't. A hospital focused approach misses numerous opportunities for quality, equity, and cost reduction. Benchmarking based on an already underfunded region is counterproductive. And superficial changes, superficial changes are, are seductive distractions when scarce funding has made your imagination for significant delivery reform rather hectic. So to boost participation, three things, three things are needed. A front end investment in infrastructure to allow rural health care sufficient buffer to take risks associated with delivery or reform, a glide path to total cost of care and meaningful measures that are properly incentivized. Next. So this then, brings me to an, a nascent idea. I, I was asked to consider what it might look like to create an APM leveraging the assets of an FQHC. So I'll, I'll try to describe that here. Uh, remember how I mentioned a minute ago that, uh, that our patient flow is centripetal? Well, what if we made the model centrifugal? What if we met the patients where they were in a, in a tailored uh, community focused model? Next. There are 1,400 community health centers in the United States, each with a designated service area. And in rural settings, expanding these areas often isn't viable due to lack of economies of scale. But 
in a value-based hub and spoke model anchored in a community health center that could pose a potential solution. This would allow health centers to widen their service footprint by forming strategic partnerships, aligning with HRSA's vision and CMS objectives. Potential ACO partners would include kind of obvious players, FQHCs, rural hospitals, local mental health agencies, while local allied contributors would consist of various interested community uh, parties. Next. The rationale for a primary care centered approach is straightforward. Uh, why, why primary care centered? What's the most direct route to achieving population health and health equity? Next. Moreover, the primary care approach is intrinsically holistic. Uh, it, it's relationship-based, community-focused, tailored and integrated using interprofessional teams where the patient is at the center. Next. And, uh, and that tailored approach creates trust, which is, which is a really big deal in Texas. Next. In rural regions, grappling with healthcare professional shortages and interprofessional primary care team isn't just ideal, it's indispensable. Uh, a team approach ensures quality outcomes while preventing burnout of the precious few physicians available. Next. Now, why, why ground a total cost of care model in the FQHC framework? Well, for starters, FQHCs already embody principles of justice and frugality, collaboration and accountability. They also bring tangible benefits like the Medicaid PPS rate, the FTCA coverage, and uh, the 340V program. Next. So if these are all of our kind of constituent pieces, let's conclude by uh, discussing how to piece together uh, a locally tailored FQHC anchored hub and spoke model of collaboration. Um, next, so envision a structure as concentric circles with the ACO at its core, supported by the aforementioned allied contributors in the immediate periphery and more distally supported by state and national agencies playing imperative roles in financing. You might even also consider USDA or other non-traditional healthcare funders for SDOH investments. Next. Since there's little to no risk tolerance within rural healthcare, and I mean, even in the investment of existing staff time and resources, much less downside contractual risks, there needs to be clear, simple glide path to progression. Next. Uh, heeding NASM's insights, both structural and programmatic resources should be considered and these should be goal aligned. Next. Prioritizing structural resources means bolstering existing rural systems so that they can confidently embrace population-based total cost of care frameworks. Next. And Congress's role includes sufficiently funding HRSA to support rural health care and subsequently HRSA via Bureau of Primary Health Care and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy should allocate unprecedented new funds for rural initiatives. CMS through CMMI should pave the way for FQHCs to, FQHCs to spearhead discussions on a tailored MSSP model for rural communities. And concurrently, CMS should incentivize non-expansion states to prioritize FQHCs in total cost of care strategies through 1115 waivers. And then finally, my last slide um, next is, uh, is, oh, sorry, one back, uh, is programmatically, um, we'll, we'll get this right here. What, there you go, perfect, that's, that's where we need to be. Uh, so uh, programmatically, if, if an MSSP is designed for a rural population, it should be simple. Um, and it should revolve around primary care. It should utilize existing resources for critical access hospitals, FQHCs and local mental health authorities. And it should emphasize initial investment in rural health infrastructure. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was a great presentation also, uh, Jackson. Just to reassure you, we do value the input from frontline providers that are out there doing the work. So. Um, and uh, lastly, we have uh, Mark. Uh, 
Great. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. I look forward to sharing my thoughts. So I was charged with uh, discussing, focusing on attribution. Uh, next slide. And so I'm going to uh, put the highlights up front. Um, my key takeaways here are that um, starting off first, most attribution schemes um, have been designed assuming it says PPS, I really should have said uh, fee-for-service data flow. Although recent modifications have been more flexible, um, and based on that, the second point, I'm, I don't think there's a lot of evidence, I should put it this way, I don't think um, attribution per se is a major factor inhibiting rural provider enrollment. Um, there's uh, certainly some thoughts, and I, I think I, um, what Ms. Pittman outlined in particular, I think is, are a couple issues to be considered, but I think um, if we had had this discussion five years ago, it would be a pretty different uh, point I would make on this, uh, but I think some of the recent changes have addressed that, and we'll get into that um, a little more in a minute. Uh, the third point is that the cost of non-PPS payment schemes that are attributed to providers may often be higher, which makes cost savings more challenging for those with beneficiaries seeing rural providers. And I want to stress that that last part there, I'm saying beneficiaries seeing rural providers, which is different from rural providers. And uh, Ms. Pittman outlined a number of these, uh, COG, cost-based, uh, Medicaid upper payment limit as it relates to rural health clinics. But I think uh, as we talk about this in particular, the notion of uh, different payment structures for many or for some types of rural providers, meaning that it can be really challenging to fit that in a fee-for-service type um, setting that we normally think of um, value-based payment models uh, being built on. And then finally, other challenges in rural contexts, such as the ability to manage financial risk and infrastructure and the infrastructure to manage utilization may be more important than attribution per se. It's always interesting to go last on a panel because um, I've been certainly circumstances where the first person raises points and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna say something totally different. But I think 80% uh, of what um, Dr. Griggs and Ms. Pittman have covered are aligned with my message as well. So um, that's, a, that's a great sign. Um, I can go through the next slide relatively quickly since this is a recap that we've uh, sort of covered. We saw the um, data on the far left, which is sort of the Notre Dame colors that GAO likes to use, uh, contrasting rural and urban participation um, on the left, as long, along with a number of challenges that um, um, inhibit participation in ACOs. And we'll, we'll talk about some of these, and some of them have certainly uh, already come up uh, so far today. Uh, next slide. So um, just a quick review for attribution um, and that payment models generally depend on the attribution of beneficiaries or members, depending on uh, whether we're thinking of private or public systems to one provider. And I'm using provider in a very general sense here. Um, it might be uh, grouped around a 10, it might be a system, it might be a clinic, it might be an individual health professional, but uh, for the purposes of this, it's not really critical. A typical rule is that the beneficiary is assigned to the provider with the plurality of E&M visits or payments for the year with some sort of tiebreaker there. So generally it's what, you know, who did the uh, patient, did the, the uh, member, did the beneficiary see and where did they get the preponderance of their care and how have we measure that. But the key design requirement built in that is that provider payments and really more accurately data but a primary source of a lot of our data comes from the payments is that it has to align with a PPS or again, uh, fee for service system. So if you're not submitting uh, payment reimbursement that's in that system, that's, you're, you're losing that ability to align them. And Ms. Pittman really hit, uh, explained that much better than I can um, in, the, in the context of, of some of um, the elements that she raised um, uh, particular federally qualified health centers is a great example. So if the reimbursement data do not support this type of model, then those providers cannot be included. And so a common approach in the past has been to say, well, we don't know what to do with them, so we're going to leave them out, um, which is a, a, a pretty typical rural story. And as an example there, the oncology care model exempted rural health clinics, federally qualified health center, critical access hospital in Maryland as well. And just saying, we don't know what to do, so they're not gonna be eligible to participate. And so um, there's a lot of interest of course in, in saying, okay, we can't, this isn't sustainable if we wanna have the uh, 
value-based payment uh, or alternative payment models on as broad a provider base as possible. So we need to come up with, with new approaches. Uh, next slide. So um, MSSP is built on it. So taxpayer identification number or TIN, I deal mostly with hospitals and so think in CCNs and this is how we uh, think about, um, about providers. But um, providers that have a large presence in rural areas such as rural health clinics, critical access hospital, particularly method two, where the, what we would normally think of as part B service is billed through the hospital and federally qualified health centers billed through CCNs, not TINs. And so a logic that's built on TINs is stuck from the beginning and can't, um, has no place to go. And so there were fixes to this. Um, as an example, the 21st Century Cures uh, Act, along with others, have added these to qualified providers by saying, all right, well, we can't see exactly what the care is that you got from RHC and F FQHC. So we're gonna assume that they're all primary care services. And so therefore any visit to an RHC or FQHC, we're gonna deem as a primary care service and qualify that for attribution. That's probably, well, the extent of my expertise, such as it is, probably says it, it's not clear that's unreasonable, uh, but was the fix in order to include uh, those providers into, the, um, into an attribution method. Now, it bundles those at the CCN level. So if you have multiple rural health clinics under one CCN, as you might if a provider-based RHC, for example, under one hospital, uh, then that would be bundled under one. Again, uh, we, we can uh, have discussions about whether that's appropriate. Uh, it's another similarity to that would be uh, Vermont's approach to for Medicaid as we, as we uh, covered earlier, uh, where they address the fact that, for example, with Medicaid churn, uh, looking at attribution based on last year wasn't going to work as well. What happens if I have a uh, beneficiary who has never gotten primary care services? Uh, that's going to be a challenge, and so they're attributed based on uh, population base. I don't really have another place to put this, but I, um, I'm going to raise it here as well. And that um, can you go back a slide? Sorry, Amy. Um, is that we also need to think about bypass and selection. And so uh, what I mean by that is certainly in the hospital literature, there are multiple studies that have shown the um, as a rural resident. Um, I have two options. I can get my, my health care locally, or I can go into a, and get it from a larger facility, typically in a non-urban uh, setting. And we, we know that um, lower income Medicare beneficiaries are more likely to get their health care locally, whether that's transportation needs or, or transportation limitations um, or uh, uh, other challenges that make it harder to go this farther distance. So what that means is that at the hospital level, you have a, a, a lower income Medicare base um, than you do based on the population. And if those same principles hold in a primary care setting, it'd be the same sort of story here that, um, you know, if I, if I don't have a car, I don't have a choice where to go. And so, you know, there may be a disproportionate level of uh, lower income at the local level. Okay, now, Amy, you can move forward. Um, so, um, Ms. Pittman may raise this point as well in her challenges um, that coding um, is, is substantially different in rural and urban settings, uh, hierarchical condition categories, which we use for risk adjustment. Um, they're generally, the scores are lower for those who see rural providers. Again, I'm choosing my words carefully there. Um, this may be an accurate measure of risk, but it also may be that rural providers do not code as completely as urban providers generally. Um, and uh, Aisha got into that uh, fairly well. Uh, the call out on the right hand uh, panel there is from a, um, a study that uh, Rupri um, out of um, well, Rural Health Value, a consortium of Rupri and Stratus Health out of Iowa put together where they uh, did sort of a, an in-depth analysis of one particular rural ACO and, and they also outline challenges with coding. And um, you know, if you go to one of these, well, larger facilities have more ability to really train their coders to understand um, coding, uh, the ramifications of long-term coding. But if you're someone whose billing doesn't depend on that, you're just not going to be as complete with that. Next slide. Um, other considerations, and really all of these fit under the, uh, the larger bucket of it all comes back to volume. Um, my sort of uh, approach to most of rural health is that 
volume is, is king. Um, and uh, we can read these in, in depth here, but uh, basically most of these come back to the, the idea that with fewer uh, lives, members, beneficiaries, patients, whatever you want to call um, uh, those bennies, um, you're often going to have lower liquidity, you're spreading your fixed cost, which includes not just uh, direct costs for technology, technology and infrastructure, but also uh, harder to understand costs such as expertise and the time to invest in understanding what these models look like are spread over fewer people. Um, and mention again that um, uh, broadening the base across multiple payers may be helpful, uh, and we heard that uh, earlier as well from Janice. Uh, last slide, um, uh, dealing with referrals and costs, and I mentioned this earlier as well, in that um, when you're looking at, uh, and there was an allusion to it earlier, uh, that uh, for many types of services, care is going to be higher, if not much higher cost in rural areas. And so what that means is that um, for not just rural providers, but also urban providers who are looking at, I would use the word steering, um, patients and whether, let's suppose I'm a rural Benny, I get my care at an urban hospital, my post-acute, I have the option to stay 50 miles away from my uh, family or go to the rural place, which it might be 20% higher cost. Um, you know, from a total cost of care standpoint, the um, uh, provider providing that care in the bundle is going to be incentivized to keep it in the urban low cost setting. Um, we have a study look at that. This particular citation is from GAO. So um, I'm at my 11 minutes. Sorry for being over. Um, and thank you for uh, your time today. Great presentation, Mark. Three really good presentations just loaded with information. Um, so um, we're going to move to some questions now. And PTAC members, if you have questions, if you'll flip your name cards over. Uh, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions, but then look to the PTAC members to, to chime in. Uh, they've been uh, asking a lot of great questions earlier today. So um, earlier today, Liz Fowler was here, and she actually gave us some ideas of things that she was curious about. And uh, I like the idea that um, one of you mentioned about building the foundation before we build the skyscraper. And so I'm interested to hear from you all very specifically, what few things would you prioritize as we change our models in regards to looking at rural health care? What would you prioritize and why would you prioritize those? So maybe if I can start out with Jackson on that one. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, quickly defer to my colleagues on what the levers are. Um, but, you know, just in, in the NASA implementing paper, uh, the argument was made that we just need more of the percentage of the overall spend on health care to go to primary care. Um, and I think that is particularly important in rural settings. Um, I, I think that uh, uh how that happens, how we get more dollars to flow into rural primary care, um, you know, that they're, um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, well, I, I think that it's going to be dependent on whether we're talking about uh, rural in far west Texas or rural in Massachusetts. I mean, there's going to be different levels of readiness uh, to move towards uh, something that's uh, risk bearing and uh, and and could you know, acquire more of the shared savings, for example. So I, I think that uh, how those dollars flow is probably more of a question for someone with a little more uh, familiarity with uh, with what the different levers are. Right. Thank you, uh, Aisha. Yeah, I'll say two things. I think one is um, more upfront investments for rural providers. Uh, I think we all documented just the technical challenges. Um, and we've seen that come into place in, in MSSP, but I think we need to think about it globally across any potential model. Then the second thing would be just ensuring that any total cost of care model has the right adequate budget. So I mentioned things about accounting for differences that we see in risk, um, differences in the, the patient populations. There's a lot of debate uh, currently around 
um, how much is regionally versus national nationally weighted if you're defining a benchmark. So I think if you um, set it more regionally, it, it can address some of the challenges that we see with um, benchmarks and their impact on rural providers. Right, thank you. And uh, Mark. Yeah, in addition to those points, I think I'm gonna expand on Aisha's last point in particular and thinking about the benchmarks. Um, there's price standardization is a common approach uh, for looking at this. So for example, for post-acute care um, in rural providers may be more expensive than um, uh, in urban settings uh, to the extent that those are included in the benchmarks and recognize that uh, we as society have made a decision and recognize that um, financial sustainability more be may be more challenging in rural areas and have designed some payment methods that recognize that. And yet that um, offers often a barrier for, for meeting benchmarks that are not rural, not aware of those rural provisions. Thank you. Um, Jim. Uh, thank you. Um, great presentations. I appreciate um, all the input. Um, I think the committee benefited a lot from what you guys have shared with us. I wanted to um, pick up on a theme that I, I've been thinking a little bit about and wanted to ask uh, you guys um, what you think about it, which is um, when we, when you, uh, Mark, you brought up the HCC risk scoring, and we've heard about this earlier today that um, there, there's, there's reasons why um, um, rural providers may not uh, focus on that as a, as a, as a strategy um, as much as um, urban uh, providers in value-based care. My, my question is kind of circulates around this idea that what about the social risk? What about area deprivation index as a proxy for social risk? And that um, an interplay, if you will, with the ADI of a community with, its, with diagnostic coding risk um, to identify uh, communities um, or differentiate different communities within the rural definition that may have more um, combined risk, both diagnostic and uh, social. And the, and the follow-on question to that would be, um, which federal departments would you recommend HHS collaborate with to stack funding streams from, for the motivated rural areas to address their vision for improved health and health equity? I'll tackle that first, I guess, and I think others can weigh in. Um, so I'll do the second part first, simply because I remember that question better, other federal agencies. Um, I think uh, USDA has a number of economic development um, approaches and particularly from a loan standpoint. And i very sympathetic to Ms. Pittman's point about um, uh, the upfront cost. I'd love to see that as a grant or recognized within the program, but loans may also be another mechanism. Uh, we, USDA tends to focus on larger facilities such as hospitals and the like, but that may be an important avenue. Uh, CDC has an Office of Rural Health that they're standing up now. They're looking for, um, as my understanding, is long-term sustainable funding. And I think when you think about uh, public health and social needs, uh, that's a great partner right there at the CDC to really leverage uh, the exciting work that they've been uh, pushing into this as of late. Um, those would be the two that I would, I would start with the federal agency standpoint. Um, the first question, see, I knew I would forget it. Can you remind me, Jim? Sorry. Yes, it's the, the idea of, of leveraging um, the area deprivation index. Yes. yes, thank you. As a proxy for social risk and somehow combining it with the HCC, HCC scores to get a better, um, m maybe more clear um, view of the risk of a population within a different rural areas. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very compelling case. Um, the thing that always makes me um, pause with these models is you have to be really careful to not have a two-track system. Uh, 
Um, and what, by that, I mean, say, oh, if we get 40% for low income, that's just as good as getting 60% for high income. And it makes it seem like we're lowering the benchmark um, and is sort of antithetic to health equity. So finding a model that recognizes it might be the, there uh, may be additional challenges with social needs. If you don't have transportation, it's harder to get you your follow-up care, but not setting a benchmark lower uh, for populations with more needs, um, just being coming up with a model that balances those two competing interests. I'll just elaborate on that. And I think ADI is a sort of tool that we have that we could use and leverage today, but ideally you would want to like use uh, patient reported social risk factors to incorporate over time. And I know there's efforts by the agency to encourage better collection of that. On the ADI, just some lessons we've learned from its use in REACH is um, you, it needs to be regionally adjusted. Um, if you're just using national ADI, you are going to, in any, any benchmarking approach, disadvantage um, urban communities um, that also have uh, other challenging needs. And then um, uh, beyond that, I think that the challenge that we see in REACH that uh, is that ADI is used to adjust the benchmark up or down. So um, those with, I forget whether, those some have a lower benchmark and others have a higher benchmark. I think there's a recognition that for vulnerable communities, it's just additional money needs to go in and you shouldn't be lowering the benchmark of other providers um, uh, to give it to different ones. So it needs to be, um, the budget neutral approach that's used in ACO reach is not something that would be sustainable more broadly. Any others want to comment on that before we move on? Uh, I, I just, I think this is probably apparent to everyone, but, but uh, in terms of coding, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we've got big urban systems, you know, hospital systems that are, you know, uh, billions in budget who have a whole workforce that's dedicated to optimizing coding. And then you've got, you know, rural health clinics and FQHCs that just don't have any uh, infrastructure to to uh, maximize coding so it's it's a sort of the the uh, i think it's uh self and i don't know literature well enough to to be able to to articulate uh, uh where the evidence is um at a sort of a national level but based on personal experience you know we're just not able to um to to, to spend our resources um without seeing a clear um, ROI there, um, and I think that's the key. It's that this is the the sort of the argument to simplify, simplify. Um, it's that uh, when we're uh, when we're engaging rural health communities that have dilapidated infrastructure, um, you know, there has to be a very clear. Um, if you do A, you will get B, and here's the timeline for the investment before you'll see uh, return on that investment. Uh, because everybody is just pedaling as fast as they can uh, already um, without the capacity to, to to see why we would add more uh, staff in order to improve coding unless there's some clear return on that. All right. Thank you. So, so given what we've heard from you all and what we've heard this morning, um, what considerations should be made when we are thinking about measuring quality in rural providers? What performance measures would you consider most appropriate for rural providers? And how can rural providers' performance most appropriately be linked to payment? We'll start out with uh, Jackson. Uh, well, I think that, um, uh, that we need to move all of our of our quality based metrics towards um, patient centered metrics, uh, and uh, and I, and I think that that poses its own challenge, sort of across uh, urban, suburban, uh, rural environments. Um, uh, but uh, but I think specific to rural environments, um, you know, I, uh, the um, uh, the. Uh, accessibility, responsiveness um, to individual needs from the time an individual needs an appointment to when they can achieve that appointment. Um, what is the, uh, what's the length of time uh, 
uh, there. Uh, what, again, I think in a, from a patient centeredness standpoint, um, the effectiveness of communication um, with an emphasis on clarity and empathy, um, uh, capacity and uh, of, um, of a therapeutic plan to incorporate the patient's unique values, um, obviously preventative screenings, um, timely interventions, hospital readmissions. Um, I think all of those things could be potential um, metrics. Integration of primary care, uh, behavioral health, oral health um, into social services, um, into care um, and the degree of integration. Um, maybe, I, I mean, I think that we've got to include um, measures of disparities in outcomes. How close are we getting to health equity? Um, by looking at uh, disaggregated data by subpopulations, particularly race uh, subpopulations, those are some some thoughts on how do we uh, how do we move towards more patient centered uh, measurements and particularly in in rural settings. Great, thank you, uh, Aisha. Can you address yeah. that? Yeah, I would uh, just concur with everything that Jackson just said in terms of how do we assess providers in a particular model. I think more globally, if we're assessing if a um, a model or an approach is working, we would also want to look at measures of access. So not necessarily assessing access at the provider level, but does the model help retain access in communities that are at a threat of losing access to care? Right. And Mark. I, I think the both uh, Aisha and Jackson have covered it very well. I have nothing to add. Perfect. Good. Well, thank you all. Um, any other questions from FETAC members? Um, if not, so I'll pose the question, um, how do we get past the small number of Benny's issue, uh, which is obviously a common issue in small practices in the, in the rural areas? Um, I'll start with uh, Mark on that one. So the approaches that uh, we just discussed, I think good, get us a long way there. So something that's patient reported, for example, uh, from a hospital setting, for example, one of the few quality measures that is consistently available at a hospital level is HCAPS uh, satisfaction. So looking at patient reported satisfaction, um, anything that's based on broad based uh, was probably going to get us a, a farther along than something like control for people with diabetes, which is going to limit your uh, percentage of eligibles pretty quickly, or the denominator. Um, this has been a standard challenge, a long-standing challenge, and I think there's a reason it remains out there and that the solutions aren't um, super palatable and it's all going to entail compromise. Um, statisticians will tell you, oh, here's an opportunity for a Bayesian model with shrinkage, but it's really hard to tell a provider, yes, you got 15 out of 15 right, but we're going to call that 87% because that's closer to the mean. And so we really have to deal from an accountability and transparency standpoint, um, something that people can understand um, when you're talking about putting um, uh, dollars at risk or any um, sort of financial incentives as well. So I think you're, this is another reason why measures of access, satisfaction, integration, uh, that were just previously outlined are far more compelling than some of the more traditional quality or cost, which is going to be highly variable if you get one air ambulance, uh, one broken femur, uh, all of a sudden your uh, total cost is out the window. Yeah, and, and I think uh, part of my uh, asking that question was to also address the actual aerial risk with such low numbers, which, which you did, so appreciate that. And so I'll uh, move to Aisha the same same question i mean i think in terms of the actuarial risk we have approaches that work if we look at like an aco model it allows providers to remain independent but share actuarial risk across a larger group of providers and then i think what happens in there is they're using quality metrics that are different than what you assess at a population level more they get to more individual metrics in terms of how they shift or reward um, individual provider level care. I think the small N is always going to be a challenge to getting to individual provider level care. And if we look at things like access, the more population health metrics, you need to assess those off from a larger group of aligned uh, providers, which is essentially what the ACO model does. Jackson. Yeah, 
Yeah, I just think it's really difficult when we're talking about FQHCs or rural health clinics uh, and particularly traditional Medicare. I mean, those numbers are just really, really small for uh, those populations. So uh, if if you have larger FQHCs um, that, I mean, I, again, I'm sort of working through this in my head, thinking about that kind of hub and spoke model. If you have larger FQHCs that can have multiple sites in smaller communities, again, you get to potentially numbers uh, that work, um, you know, it, the obviously, uh, like I said, the ACO um, you know tries to ac account for that, uh, but um, uh, but that ACO ends up having again for for a Medicare population um, ends up having to rely heavily on a lot of front end work, uh, building the relationships, maintaining the relationships. The HIT, which we haven't gotten to in rural environments, is is just uh, terrible. I mean, there's just no uh, sophisticated health information technology workforce um, or systems base in rural environments to 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 gather the data. Um, so I, I think all that says there's got to be front end investment like we started with in order to get the collaborations built, the HIT developed, um, and uh, even even the uh, the technical assistance in developing a, a, a properly fit. Uh, ACO when there are so many MSSP options to to sort of select from. So all that's got to be kind of baked into um, any initiative to get rural health um, uh, up to play. Yeah, I like that. And so going back to my actual first question, um, if we put more money into primary care and we're paying for upfront cost, what do you all consider the most important thing that you want to make sure that money goes to? Obviously, putting more money into primary care, not necessarily going to their uh, biweekly paycheck, but what are, what are they using that money to invest in? What do you think are the top three priorities that we need to make sure they're focused on with that money? Again, I'll start, start out with uh, Jackson again. Uh, so... The, the vision for the interprofessional primary care team has not been realized in large part because there's not funding for uh, uh, health professions outside of traditional medical providers. So if I had community health workers, if I had uh, social workers um, who were on my team, if I had uh, uh, nutritionists who could, who could join me and help, um, life coaches, I mean, there, there's a whole array, promotoras, uh, doulas, um, there, there are proven strategies that we just can't pay for right now. So I, I think that staffing uh, the interprofessional primary care team is is uh, one uh, one of those top three. Um, then uh, I think data reporting infrastructure, um, and so health information technology um, would be uh, would be a key second. Um, and uh, and then uh, just back to my kind of Maslow's hierarchy, um, there are so many infrastructural things at, our, you know, our, we're one of the larger FQHCs, uh, we have 62,000 patients, so we, uh, and, and we just can't retain nurses because we can't pay market rates, you know, I mean, it, it, we're competing with big hospital systems that have had big mergers and huge economies of scale, and uh, we're competing for the same stuff. So there's a lot of just basic infrastructural things that uh, with more dollars flowing into primary care, we could address um, just to stabilize our basic um, uh, operations. Yeah, I would, um, this is should concur exactly with what Jackson said. And then also um, one thing additional is just uh, increased investment in primary care, and particularly if you're doing that as a population-based uh, prospective payment, you can get rid of some of the constraints of being limited to providing services that are simply in the CPT book and addressing a broader set of services. And I think this is the way that we're gonna be able to address um, social uh, needs a little bit better as well. Yeah, I like that. And so I had written down um, Jackson's uh, interprofessional care teams, I think, being critical. But as we heard earlier, if there's no um, social organizations that can address those needs in within 50 miles, you're kind of stuck. So I call this part partnership cultivation. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but helping um, working with the community to help uh, address those needs and make sure those resources are there. 
uh, identifying someone who's food insecure is helpful, but less so if you can't say, well, here's where to go next. Thank you. So can any of you um, identify rural models out there that have been demonstrated to work well? And can you cite those and um, you know, give us some insight into the, to those? I think the evidence we have tends to be those that are more integrated. So system-based um, looking, I'm gonna try not to identify any specifics, uh, but those that are um, really cross services, um, systems that include inpatient, outpatient, post-acute, something that looks closer to a global budget type setting where you don't have the incentives um, that have been identified over the last five hours, I guess, four and a half hours at this point. Um, and where, it, because the fact of the matter is that um, many, for many rural services, it is hard to compete financially because of that volume. Um, and so um, if we can find a model that recognizes we as 340 million Americans have decided that we're willing to uh, help support those rural places because we think healthcare is a right. And I'm, as I'm driving down I-80 and whatever, you know, in the Midwest, I hope that there's a hospital there in case I have an accident. Now, again, that's antithetic to most of what we're talking about here. So all that is to say, the original question was, oh, where does it work best? And those are places where um, you have multiple uh, providers usually act, you know, acting as one that often is something that could be as formal as one dominant system. Right, thank you. Aisha? Yeah, um, I think elaborating, um, I, I agree with that point in that seeing uh, where you can implement global budgets, that's something that we've heard from our, our members while you know, they would say that the ACO model works for rural providers. I think I brought to the table a lot of things where we would want to see it shifted. Those shifted those shifts in ACO model work, but I think also there's a desire to think about global budgets and the uh, the advantage of global budgets being that they're all payer and that the model is not just limited to just Medicare fee for service, but it's across the board. And I think um, one of the things where we've seen it's been successful and that approach for rural providers is in the, the Maryland model in stabilizing payment to rural providers. Great, Jackson. Uh, I don't I don't have uh, examples like Aisha and Mark. I, um, there, there was a, um, a paper that uh, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy uh, put out that was uh, titled a guide to rural health collaboration 2019 is the date on that and and they gave some um, practices that were that were working in terms of uh, collaborating between rural agencies w one of which i i just illustrated in the appendix of of my slides happened to be with a, a critical access hospital and an fqhc that demonstrated some improvements in um, cash on hand and net margins for both entities once they began to collaborate. So. Perfect, thank you. Cheney, you have a question? Thank you to our panel. Um, this question is to start out with from Mark and obviously also the rest of the panel, we wanna hear your thoughts as well. Um, when we talk about, you know, what I'm hearing through this discussion is basically that, you know, systems-based sort of prospective payment or population-based interprofessional primary care team should be incentivized. And, and access, Aisha had mentioned access as well as a qual for uh, a possible quality metric. When you take the three of those together, one of the things that's been floated is a solution in providing access care and good care to um, rural-based populations is telehealth. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how telehealth, whether it be removing barriers and restrictions, or it could be an attribution model if embedded into sort of a, a total cost of care. That's a great question, thank you for that. So for years we've been saying the promise of telehealth and it wasn't until March, 2020 that we really started seeing it 
get utilized. Of course, what we saw is that um, urban, bene I think, being careful, I think it's urban beneficiaries ended up using telehealth more than rural, which I think kind of surprised some people, but is really consistent with what we've talked about with broadband um, barriers and the like, for example. So one thing, and I, this is a opinion, uh, I've not found any studies and I continue to look for this. I think when we talk about telehealth, we have to be really um, explicit about who's benefiting. And by that, I mean, as a um, resident beneficiary, I, you know, I love telehealth. When my, when my son broke his um, toe on the beach, I was able to hold the phone over it and get a you know, consult within 20 minutes when nothing was around me uh, was open. Uh, that was great for me. But as telehealth becomes more accessible, I'm not sure what that means for care that used to go locally to the rural. So if, for example, in that case, my trade-off was um, go to the ED, the urgent care that's just down the road, instead I connected with someone, I don't know where this telehealth uh, unit was based, um, that was care that was now being delivered at, a, at an urban setting. Um, so if we're talking about rural providers, I, I think the, the, uh, we still don't know yet what the ramifications of that are. I think we're just starting to see the data come in. If we're talking about rural beneficiaries and rural patients, I think it seems pretty clear that telehealth is a, is a net plus. And I wanna also separate, uh, let's call it what, rural specialty. So things like telepsych, or sorry, tele uh, specialty. So telepsych, I think, is a very different ball game. If there's nothing with, if I cannot find a mental health professional within an hour of me, but I can connect to something locally, yes, that's great, and I can get access to it. But um, uh, I think it's a what triple-edged sword on the economist. So I always say on on this hand and on the other hand, but there might actually be three hands in this case. Just being mindful of what it is that. Um, the, the multiple ramifications of telehealth and how it impacts different populations, um, uh, I think, need to be thought out carefully. Jackson? Yeah, I think it's a question of, uh, of if you build it, will they come? Um, uh, the, uh, and while I wholeheartedly agree with Mark that, uh, that there's a broadband issue and rural populations that uh, would have to be addressed, then, then there is, uh, in addition to uh, what's the best fit for um, telehealth in terms of clinical practice, this issue of, of trust. Uh, you know, what, what shocked me during the pandemic was how, uh, uh, how evidenced um, medical interventions became um, polarized along political along the political spectrum and how the trust in um, in the traditional institution of medicine um, eroded very very quickly um, I think that when we're when we're thinking about rural populations um, we have to apprise the culture of the different ruralities again I, you know I mentioned before you know West Texas versus Massachusetts rural might be very very different I know that uh, uh, telehealth as a one size fits all. I don't think if you build it, they will they will come. I I know in our community, um, uh, we've had a while we've had telehealth up since uh, uh, I think it was April um, in 2020. Um, we've just seen very sluggish uptake, um, and people were very quick to return to uh, their primary care clinician. Um, but have been, despite all of our promotion and marketing and trying to make it as easy as possible, um, particularly aging population just has not had a large uptake in. Uh, so, so there's some medical skepticism. Uh, there's uh, some erosion of trust in the um, in the industry of medicine. But I still, I, I certainly trust this this doctor who I know. Well, they're you know they're my family doctor. Um, of course, I I you know I trust Doctor you know Smith. You know, but um, but. Uh, seeing a stranger on a screen, there's just layers of kind of cultural barriers, I think, for a lot of our rural populations. Aisha? The only one quick point I'll add to um, Mark's point of we didn't really see telehealth use until uh, 2020. And I think while there have been telehealth waivers available in any sort of model test, 
it has not been expansive of what was uh, permitted during the public health emergency. So I think it just, in thinking about how different communities will t will utilize telehealth, we also have to think about how it's restricted and where we wanna waive the current fee-for-service requirements and really open up telehealth in the context of, of value models. Those concerns about um, fraud and abuse are really mitigated when you're responsible for a population and are gonna ensure, and for cost and quality, you're gonna ensure that they're gonna have in-person visits when necessary and utilize telehealth as, as available. And we just haven't had that in the models to date. So I think we can take some lessons learned from the pandemic and apply that in any sort of value or arrangement. Yeah, I just add on that, that sometimes telehealth can help with things that you couldn't get otherwise. Um, there's a narrative I heard, which we always have to be careful with that, but someone talking about they had uh, telehealth with one of their patients and um, they were bundled up in a jacket and a blanket and they're like, what's going on? Like, well, my heat was cut off two days ago. Oh, that and you might not have picked that up if an in office visit. So the ability to um, sometimes get a different perspective on uh, circumstances that may be um, affecting healthcare is maybe enhanced in telehealth setting. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'm gonna ask a, t a tiny question, but I think it's, it's interesting and it's repeatedly come up related to rural. So um, I think a lot about transportation. So we've talked about um, hubs, we've talked about telehealth, but I'm curious um, what each of you are seeing or if you have seen innovation in really solving for transportation. I work with many rural counties in design, um, more for Medicaid populations, but I've seen some interesting things there emerge. And then I personally, when I'm not traveling, live on a farm in Appalachia. And there is a um, underground railroad for getting people to healthcare that occurs in the mountains where people know who to call and that's how you get fast enough to an emergency room that can treat you or to pain management or the things. So I don't, it just has made me reflect interestingly. So the question is, have you seen innovation in solving for transportation and what has that looked like outside of the telehealth? I'll be real quick. We just started using um, Uber Health, a ride sharing program. Uh, and, and I think that that may offer us uh, you know, some potential ways which to uh, to bring some of our more remote uh, rural populations in to see us. However, we're eating that cost right now. I mean, if we were to move towards uh, population-based total cost of care, global cap, you know, obviously that'd be part of the, the spin, but but it, um, uh, right now it's it's something we're just, um, we're just eating. Um, I love Lauren's story. Um, to me, this is one is, um, there aren't, we want to think about rural with an asset based lens and there aren't many assets that we can leverage. And one of those is the social capital. Social connectedness is often much higher in rural communities. And you've given a ex perfect example for that, whether it's built around, you know, the school or the house of worship or whatever. Um, I think that's a great opportunity, but of course you're leveraging a volunteerism base, um, which is not, is more difficult to take the scale. Um, so I, I think that's important to address. Um, the microtransit that Jackson uh, had mentioned, I've, I've written down as well. And then a third would be community paramedicine, um, where if I have an EMS truck that's uh, not doing anything basically at a, at a time, then I can use that for house calls and can address a lot of this interprofessional um, uh, care as well. So I think that's not, technically addressing your transportation, uh, Lauren, in the sense that it's not getting the patient out, but in as many ways it may be better. Because once again, it, I get up there and I can see sort of what's going on in, in this setting. So I have one last question, kind of re reflecting back on the comment Aisha made. So just curious, and I think we've talked about it over the course of the day with all the, the support that we've talked about giving rural primary care practices, but just thinking through, so what would encourage a well-performing urban ACO to want to incorporate a rural 
practice, knowing that their infrastructure costs are going to be higher and their outcomes are going to be lower, how would you see that being structured so that they would be incorporated into a larger ACO, a larger pool of patients? So I'll start out with Aisha on that. I think it gets to the type of community served. So we already see uh, urban and rural combined, depending on, you know, particularly with some of the larger health system ACOs, it is how they saw a broader net of, of patients. And I think if we address some of the things like attribution and, and the benchmarks, they'll be more encouraged to bring those, those providers into the model. I think there's also something to be said for um, rural communities banding together to manage risk a across them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be connected back to an, an urban community. We see that as well that multiple rural communities come together to form ACOs. Any others have comments on that question? Sometimes hospitals will do this to get access to high value services. Um, I'm not sure that's a strategy we want to encourage, but the idea being, um, if I can't, if I, as a urban, uh, I think, um, a large urban system can work with a rural ACO that's high performing, um, and I can figure out a way to get some of those high value services, cardiology, orthopedics, for example, to come to my system, that could be an incentive, but, um, that's an economist talking. I'm not sure that's really the kind of thing that we want to uh, leverage, but that's that might be one driver. Got it. Um, Jackson, any comment about that? No, thanks. So before we uh, close, any, any issues that we've not covered today or any insights that you all want to share with us? Um, the end of this. I think the only thing I would mention is um, the definition of rural community came up um, both from Dr. Fowler as well as you, Angelo. I think you mentioned this in the previous session. And I think uh, there are multiple places to draw the line for what is rural. Um, one, I'd say one thing that did not come up was a FAR code, which is, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's basically, as you might expect, how far is this zip code from a large city kind of thing? And that might be um, an alternative way to think about some of this, because that really gets at access. But no matter where you draw the line, um, there's going to be a, um, a, one of these rural communities is going to look least rural. Um, and so I do a lot with rural definitions. Uh, a lot of the people I talk to say, I drive by a cow on my way to work. That must mean I'm in a rural community. I'm like, no, you work with me. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we need to think about it more than that, but it's going to vary depending on the setting. And so um, if I'm getting my radiation oncology treatment, what probably matters more than anything is how far I'm driving every day for five weeks in a row for that. If I'm an oncology, you know, getting an um, infusion, then probably it's going to be, do I have a, 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 a sufficient number of people in my community to support uh, an oncologist. So it, it, it's going to depend on this particular service, which always means that um, there's no great answer. Perfect. Any other comments? Uh, just the fact that in order to be able to measure performance of rural communities, one against another to judge for, uh, how we're going to fund, you know, th this kind of programmatic intervention versus that one, we, we got to get the definitions uh, down. And so I, I, I agree. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark. Perfect. Good. So thank you all. This has been another great session. It is very informative. It's going to help help us create a great document to send to the secretary. And so, um, so I think that we're going to uh, break at this point. And uh, you all are welcome to stay and listen to as much of the next meetings as, as you would like. We certainly love to have you stay on and listen. Uh, but right now, we'll go ahead and take a break until 2.40. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.